the Democrat. I was alone in my apartment getting dressed for my first day at my new job. Two LAPD officers knocked on my door. Are you the legal owner of a 1979 Volvo 240 DL? Yeah, that's my car. Your vehicle has been in an accident. It was then I found out the Democrat was dead. The Democrat was my nickname for the brown box of a car that I had been driving for six years. <laughs> I bought it for $500 and then paid another $500 to have a rebuilt engine put in. In my hometown of Santa Cruz, this is the type of car that would have the back end plastered in bumper stickers emblazoned with you can't feed children with nuclear arms, think globally, act locally, and a couple of cherry bears. Hence the name, the Democrat. In car conscious Los Angeles, you were judged by your vehicle. I was likely judged to be a community college liberal arts teacher who didn't shave her legs. <laughs> I was not, I was just cheap. <laughs> the police walked me down my Koreatown street and across Wilshire Boulevard. As we walked, one of the officers explained that a new Honda had been stolen in Glendale, leading the CHP on a high-speed chase through downtown. The Honda had then exited the 110, taking the chase onto surface streets at speeds up to 90 miles per hour. The Honda then struck another vehicle head-on in an intersection near where my car was parked. The Honda had spun around and slammed into the Democrat, dragging it halfway down the street where they both came to rest, straddling a large utility box. <laughs> I resisted the urge to ask which route this guy took from downtown during rush hour. <laughs> <laughs> drive six blocks at this time of day. Did you take Venice all the way? <laughs> Olympic? How do you catch air on Pico? <laughs> Instead, I asked how the people in the other car had been, who had been hit on and how they'd fared. The officers told me that the driver and passenger both had serious injuries but were conscious and seemed like they would make it through. The thief had also been taken to the hospital and he too was expected to make it. I would be contacted in the next few weeks about having to appear at his arraignment since my car had been involved as a victim of a crime. <laughs> when we got through the crowd surrounding the blocked off intersection, I saw my car. She was totaled. The twisted hunk of metal was barely recognizable as my Swedish sedan. As I sat on the curb, waiting to have the car towed to the junkyard, I realized that if my car had not been parked where it was, the Honda would have likely made the turn and kept on going, possibly injuring more people or worse. The Democrat was not a victim, she was a hero. <laughs> and I, the proud owner, had 40 minutes left to figure out another way to get across town to West LA for my first day of work. <laughs> I rented a car for a few days to get to and from my new job at the outpatient program. I tried to figure out my next automotive, automotive move, but lacking funds, my choices were limited. Jeff and I had been seeing each other less than two months at this point. When he made me an offer, I was in no position to refuse. Jeff's name <laughs> Jeff offered to sell me his mini minivan for a dollar. <laughs> I accepted. <laughs> the 1997 Plymouth Grand Voyager had been Jeff's tour van for his last band. They had driven it back and forth across the country a number, number of times, and it had seen better, cleaner days. The interior smelled like the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disneyland. <laughs> Jeff had been eyeing a new hybrid and decided to buy it a little sooner than he had planned in order to give me some wheels. He spelled like that. One of my job duties at the teen outpatient program would involve driving some of the teenage patients to and from appointments. The van would be perfect. I spent $18 at the car wash, ordered some cheap replacement hubcaps off the internet, three, um, gassed her up, and we were ready to roll. On my third day, behind the wheel of the Voyager, I had made a deal with my two 16-year-old passengers, Tommy and Adam. I would let them pick the radio station, and in exchange, they would stop begging me to let them pick the radio station. <laughs> <laughs> it was a sweltering afternoon, and we had the air conditioner blasting as we crawled along in the Santa Monica Boulevard traffic, enjoying the sweet, sweet sounds of 3-6 Mafia. <laughs> <laughs> the air shut off, and the temperature gauge started moving up. We were overheating. Having driven old, crappy cars almost exclusively, exclusively in my driving <laughs> career, I knew that with an overheating car, I needed to first turn the heater on to high to try and pull some of the heat away from the engine. 
with the 103 degree temp outside and the heater set to 10, the interior of the van felt as if we were driving onto the face of the sun. <laughs> I rolled down all the car windows and inched along back to the office, treating the nearby motorists to pussy got your hook. <laughs> speakers. I silently prayed that my boss would not drive by. <laughs> when I got back to my desk, I immediately called Jeff and told him what had happened. He explained that he was aware of the van's compressor problem. Then he said, I guess I need to take it to a real mechanic. What do you mean? You've been taking it to a pretend mechanic? <laughs> not exactly. He's more of a psychic. <laughs> pistol of a grandmother, Graham Melba, got a cough. It rattled in her chest, and she described it as feeling like something was broken inside. Two weeks later, she was diagnosed with cancer. When she heard her diagnosis, she was angry about her lifelong smoking habit. She wasn't angry that she had ever started. She was angry that she had bothered to quit four years before. <laughs> she missed her smoky friends. Within a month, she was in intensive care. The, Greek, the week Graham went into the hospital was the same week that my first marriage was ending, not to joke. I sat with Graham in the ICU and told her about the breakup. We had divided our possessions. We were moving out of the house and I had found my own apartment. Graham listened and nodded. Soon she would be fitted with a tube that would help her breathe but would not allow her to speak. She grabbed my arm and pulled me close. She was still able to talk but not above a whisper. I realized that this would likely be our last conversation. What she said next would be her final words to me. I expected her to tell me that I would be okay, or that she was proud of me, or that she loved me. Instead, Graham said, get the China. For <laughs> <laughs> my Graham, this was a perfect party shot. She died a few days later. I shared the story of her final words with my soon-to-be ex. He knew Graham well, and he listened and laughed in the right places. Two days later, I returned home from work, and sitting on the doorstep of my new apartment was his half of the dishes, carefully wrapped in newspaper and packed inside a large moving box. Mm -hmm. I got the china. I miss her every day. Aww.